and welcome to World Inside with Tian Wei, coming to you live from Beijing on CGTN. Coming up on today's program, Chinese delegates are in Washington, D.C. for the first round of China-U.S. Comprehensive Economic Dialogue. Can the two sides overcome mistrust over trade deficits and forge more trade deals? People's march toward urbanization has reduced the agricultural land use across the globe. Today, we speak to a scientist who wants to maximize resources to feed our planet. And we begin in Washington, D.C. in the United States, where senior officials from China and the U.S. are meeting for the very first round of talks on economic and trade issues. The China-U.S. Comprehensive Economic Dialogue aims to iron out the kinks in China's business relationship with America. Chinese President Xi Jinping's first summit with U.S. President Donald Trump resulted in a 100-day limit to solve a list of contentious topics. Trump's presidency, though, has raised the concern that the world's largest economy could turn inward and embrace protectionist policies. Building dialogue. China has sent a delegation of senior officials to the U.S. to attend the first round of the China-U.S. Comprehensive Economic Dialogue. It is among the four pillar platforms that the two countries have set up to have high-level direct talks. Our working relationship is better today than it has been in many decades. Even though we may occasionally disagree on individual items, we have fundamentally shared objectives. Trade deficit is one of the major topics for the two sides. There are continued flashpoints over subsidies in key trade sectors, such as steel. And rising protectionism is also a big concern. Unfortunately, American businesses have not had their fair share of the cake due to outdated U.S. regulations on export control. In 2001, U.S. high-tech export to China accounted for 16.7 percent of China's total import of such products, while last year the percentage dropped to 8.2 percent. During the China-U.S. Comprehensive Economic Dialogue, China and the U.S. will summarize the achievements of the 100-day plan and further discuss the details of the one-year plan. Another hot topic might be the BIT, or the Bilateral Investment Treaty. President Trump agreed to resume discussing the negative list under certain preconditions. I'm not very optimistic that we will make um, uh, headway over uh, issues like the bilateral trade deficit very quickly. Uh, but over the course of uh, a president's four-year or, of course, even eight-year term, um, it is possible that the dynamics can change. The growth potential of China's market is huge, presenting wide-ranging opportunities for China-U.S. cooperation. While tensions are likely to persist, this dialogue could enable the two players to find a solution through negotiation. So what's the deal for discussion at the comprehensive economic dialogue between China and the United States? The very first time such dialogue, at least in that name, takes place. We have in our Beijing studio with us uh, two Chinese panelists and also joining us from the United States, two American panelists in China. Yang Xiyu, Senior Research Fellow from the China Institute of International Studies. Liu Baocheng, Professor and the Dean of the Center for International Business Ethics from University of International Business and economics. Joining us in Washington, D.C., Douglas Paul, Vice President of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Also in Washington, Steve Glickman, who's an adjunct assistant professor at Georgetown University and a former director for international economic affairs at the White House. Gentlemen, welcome to the four of you. The very first time, China-U.S. Comprehensive Economic Dialogue. It takes us every four years to remember the name of a new dialogue. But the question really is, are we going to achieve anything substantial this time? I'm going to go Chinese-American, Chinese-American. Okay, so uh, Mr. Yang, very briefly from you. Uh, no, simply because uh, the target for this meeting uh, does not uh, uh, act uh, uh, some achievement, but to discuss the plans for the next phase of the economic ties. Okay, Mr. Glickman, much hope. Big deals or not? Well, a little, uh, probably not big deals, but a little bit of hope. I, you got to remember the political context here. In, in 2016, President Trump was very critical of the Chinese-U.S. relationship. 
It's also a political year in China with the 19th Party Congress happening in the fall. So just keeping the status quo would be a big accomplishment, avoiding some kind of tit-for-tat trade war. And in the very short term, you've seen some progress uh, in the 100-day talks on issues like beef and poultry, uh, and we'll see if other issues uh, come out as well. But in terms mm. of very big issues for the U.S.-China relationship, I'd be very surprised if you saw much progress this year at all. Professor Liu, yours? I think, uh, well, over the 100 days, we already had a, a early harvest. So the, it means that uh, uh, after all the changes uh, from the SED into CED, uh, we are really seeing some, uh, uh, you know, uh, some light at the end of the tunnel. So the, uh, I hope that, uh, you know, uh, with the one-year plan under discussion, particularly to uh, move forward with the BIT, yeah. I would really anticipate there's going to be something if not significant, but rather, rather substantial. Mr. Paul, are you seeing as much light as Professor Liu just did? Um, well, you know, as Professor Glickman said, this is a big contrast. The fact is, the headline of this meeting will probably be, there are no headlines, mm. because we're not having a trade war initiated by the United States against China. I think the administration, for a variety of reasons, is settled into office and discovered that American exports to China, even though they're unbalanced in our overall trade relationship, are growing rapidly and they depend on China's continued relatively rapid pace of growth to absorb more American uh, exports and therefore uh, maintain more American jobs. So I think the, the friction has significantly been reduced and to me that's the headline. Mm. One, one month after 100 day plan, you know, 100 plan 100 day plan, what exactly is it? What have been included in it? How much really it would mean for the bilateral trade ties? We take a look at that. Both sides announced a series of initial actions for this so called 100 day plan. It covered sectors as agriculture, financial services, and also energy. We have already witnessed the reopening of the Chinese beef market to the United States and the U.S. poultry market as well, and better access for American financial services providers to China. The U.S. also sent representatives to the Belt and Road Forum in May, even though it is not as high level as some people would expect. Having said that though, let me ask you about this, Professor Liu. Beef, poultry, liquefied natural gas, all of this Will they really change much, the trade structure between China and the United States? Well, the answer is no, uh, because they really take a, uh, a very insignificant portion of the entire uh, you know, trade volume between uh, China and the uh, and United States. And also given the trade gap, it's uh, uh, almost constantly staying at uh, 300 billion U.S. dollars. But uh, it is a really a positive move, and particularly after the uh, mm. White House, uh, you know, uh, is really changing its president. So it's uh, really there to settle the sentiment and also to move in the r right constructive direction. Okay, there is one, as China sees it, a constructive direction, uh, Professor Glickman. That is, why don't you, the United States, export some of the high-tech products to China? Last year it was 16%, and this year it's dropping even more. Only 8% of U.S. products among all the high-tech products imported by China. Things are not doing good. Why don't you just do that, and the trade will really go balanced? Well, the, the issue of high-tech exports is complicated. Yeah. The U.S. saves its most sensitive high-technology products for for countries that are its closest allies. And obviously the U.S. and China, are, while they're both important trading partners, are also strategic competitors. Uh, the export control system prevents um, uh, certain products from going to China now. Maybe that can improve. What I think is really notable, though, in that first 100 days is the U.S. has already made some pretty serious concessions on issues like poultry and natural gas. And the question is what other concessions could could the U.S. make? It's also uh, uh, agreed to go along with the Chinese um, One Belt, One Road strategy, or at least is allowing it to go forward, as well as a, another Chinese negotiation uh, with other Asian allies. And that's what makes the U.S. pulling out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership such a big deal. It's, it's lost a lot of the leverage it could have had mm. in gaining a closer relationship with some of 
uh, the other trading partners in Asia that China really relies upon. Okay. So the question is, where else can the U.S. go from here? And I bet not much. All right. Professor Liu, you probably want to respond to your American colleague. First of all, not exporting high-tech products to China, not as much. Mm. Uh, will that make U.S. safer? Uh, will that make U.S. competitive among all the other players in the world? Secondly, about the BRI, does China need a nod from the United States to go ahead with the BRI? Well, I do not think that can really make the uh, United States safer because uh, with a uh, staunch the uh, partner in uh, Asia can really help them to reduce the cost of maintaining stability around the world and also given China's history of non-aggression. And uh, on the other side, we also, theoretically, we see that uh, while well, United States as the, as the advanced economy, they should supply more of the technology to a developing country like China. But now it turned out to be a paradox, and uh, well, we are buying more of the agricultural right. produce, we are buying more of the beef and all that stuff. So it's really theoretically, uh, you know, very uh, intriguing. So in the trade pattern, I should say. All right. What about the BRI? Does China need a nod from the United States to go ahead with this initiative? Well, I do not think really uh, China can really make its own uh, decision. So therefore, uh, the. Uh, long arm jurisdiction, uh, as the spokesman of the foreign affairs uh, okay. says, well, uh, is not really valid to uh, maintain to, or to contain. All right. Mr. Yang, if uh, the United States does not export the high-tech products to China, some of the others will, because China oh, yeah. every year importing more than an enormous amount of stuff. But the thing is, what about Professor Liu just said? that it's interesting if you look at the structure of China-U.S. trade, that the U.S. is going with the very basic uh, kinds of exports to China, not like a developing, oh, yeah. developed economy, Develop. but yeah. rather, um, so, so is there a way to fix this structure, to make it really balanced? What is the key to have the trade balanced? Well, theoretically and ideally, uh, for balancing the trade, we need to make the pie bigger mm. rather than to cut off the uh, pie smaller. So how to make it bigger? I think high-tech area is uh, the greatest potential. And also for uh, American national interests, the life of high-tech is quite limited. This year you are high-tech, next year no. So the, uh, the banning or limiting high-tech export to China mm. means uh, should, uh, should, uh, should their uh, feet uh, uh, for, by themselves. So I think uh, uh, reasonable uh, lifting some high-tech restrictions will be very helpful for both of the sides. All right. Mr. Gleekman, you want to respond to your Chinese colleagues briefly? Well, I, the, the U.S. does export all sorts of high technology items and complicated manufactured mm -hmm. products to, to China. That's frankly most of what we make here. Um, a lot of the, the lower uh, uh, technology manufacturing items have already been lost to, to ch China and other competitors. But when you talk about the most sensitive technologies the U.S. produces, mm. there's a lot of concern within the U.S. national security apparatus that uh, that by exporting that to China, we're going to put the U.S. At, at a competitive disadvantage and in some ways threaten our, our national security. All right. Uh, it, now, keep in mind, this, this is this is limited to a very small number of items that the U.S. produces and sells overseas, uh, and one that's unlikely to make a lot of uh, change or progress on over the next year. Mm. Mr. Paul, you are a China expert. I mean, you've been watching the U.S.-China relations for decades, so let me ask you about this. We do not now concentrate on just small issues. Let's talk about this trend, the trend about how the U.S. sees China when it comes to trade and economic ties. There is the issue of looking at near term, you know, when you think about the beef, when you think about the poultry and things like that. It's something very near term. It's about your political constituency. Everybody knows that. But then there is the long term vision, but the long term vision all seems to be concerns and worries. For example, long term, the United States worry about uh, exporting real high tech products to China and that would threaten the U.S. security. So there is very short vision of so-called near term and also the very concerning and worrying long-term visions people have about China. This interesting combination makes the trade very hard to be readjusted. Mr. Paul. Well, it's if you focus just on the bilateral trade, you're going to always end up having discussions about 
you know, new market niches for beef and poultry and other things. Uh, but these are really rather small. Mm. Uh, the bulk of American exports is constituted of waste products and paper, waste metals that are reprocessed in China, and uh, agricultural products, soybeans, every third soybean in America goes to China. And these are the, these are the major uh, export products. Where you want to look forward long term, it's harder to make headlines out of this, but it's the efforts to reopen the services market in mm. China that uh, really has the greatest promise. And that's where the Chinese economy is going, into greater dependency on services, more sophisticated financial services. Uh, we've been discussing in this uh, period since Trump came to office how to get the credit card people into China. And I went and visited with the credit card representatives in Beijing <laughs> a month and a half ago or so. And they were very uh, optimistic that the uh, outcome of the first uh, early harvest was going to benefit their position. Mm. But you know, we've got a real moving target here in China. Credit cards are going passe. I, I suspect you spend most of your money on day to day things through your cell phone, That's right. through Alipay Cashless. or a similar system. And that's, uh, we've, we're followed, we've got to get in and learn how to do this. We're getting behind on these things. So I think the, the big picture has got to be in the services trade, not the material trade. Moreover, China's export machine is going to shift more and more offshore platforms, whether they follow the Belt and Road Initiative or they go off on a purely commercial basis. Uh, China's manufacturing is going to be manufacturing somewhere else, mm -hmm. and it'll come off the list of things that are in our bilateral trade deficit. And we will look more and more to balance that trade, not with uh, high tech, which the U.S. is already selling about as much high tech as we're going to sell to China. It's an overstated issue. It's a 20-year-old talking point. Okay. Uh, and, and it's also been complicated by China's China 2025 initiative, which suggests that China wants to grab some of these technologies to produce them at home. And therefore, it's not just national security that's a concern. It's also uh, market con uh, security yeah. that uh, inhibits the trade in high-tech goods. You know what? A lot of the things are really 20-year-old talking points, unfortunately, Mr. Paul, <laughs> because there has been a lack of trust between the two countries to really crack on the really tough issues. So unfortunately, we're still tackling with what we had uh, 20 years ago. And, and having said that, though, Professor Liu, let me go to you about that. You know, one of the things about China and United States have this mechanism is about Possibly, this mechanism is not just to fix the numbers beautifully, but also manage to help, at least to a certain extent, both sides to take a look at its own economy and its own economic and financial structure and think about how we can improve as a result of this platform by looking at each other. Do you think there is still that kind of momentum? that kind of possibility for, the China, for China and the United States with this kind of mechanism? I think yes. Uh, and, uh, the, in terms of the dialogue, you know, splitting the uh, SED into four tracks, uh, uh, that can really drive the discussion and even negotiation into more in-depth mm. and more deliverables. And I think that the, uh, uh, a very decisive solution is to have more of the Chinese investment uh, in the United States because that can really turn made in China into made in the U.S. or Chinese companies work with the U.S. company in a third country. Okay. So that can really mitigate the uh, trade deficit, you know, suffered at least on the book, you know, from China. And also the financial services. There has been a lot of talk about the opening up China's financial services. We just had the, the so-called National Financial Conference. It's being held once every five years. And this time it's coming up with a, a super, uh, super body for supervision, I guess. That's true. So how will all of these changes going on in China in a way impact on the possibilities of discussions between China and the United States. Professor Liu, very briefly from you. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, uh, China uh, and the United States should be really uh, get, more, uh, say, uh, pro provide more of the transparency in terms of data, in terms of, uh, in terms of information, so that people can really talk over the same thing. All right. And uh, number two is that uh, the uh, businesses need to be motivated to participate more into the discussion instead of only, you know, between politicians. I see. Uh, okay, let's go to Professor Glickman. He was nodding his head while his Chinese colleague was making the point. So, <laughs> Professor Glickman, oh, go ahead. 
Well, I, I think he made a really good point, and particularly about the bilateral investment relationship between the U.S. and China. There was some progress made in the last administration on improving that relationship. Some of the U.S.'s largest issues in China right now relate to its investors and its investment position there, how companies are treated in China, uh, whether, it, 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 whether issues around uh, forced technology mm. transfer, intellectual property protection, uh, rule of law issues. And on the, on the flip side, the, one of China's most significant issues in the U.S. is how it uh, views its investment through the U.S. CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, basically the U.S.'s national security investigations of Chinese investment that it feels it's being uh, improperly treated for some of those investments. There is a long way for that relationship to grow. In the scheme of investment in the U.S., China is still a small player but a fast-growing one. It's a much smaller player than uh, a lot of the uh, U.S.'s European investment partners. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of room to grow, and, and as the professor said, those inv that, that Chinese investment does lead to more manufacturing and more jobs in the U.S. It's something that's politically potentially challenging, but economically a very positive, could be a very positive development for the U.S. I see. Having said that, though, gentlemen, there are two fundamental questions that we really need to discuss before we wrap up our show today. One is, what about the ideology when it comes to international trade and economic ties? I mean, Trump administration has been talking about believing in bilateral rather than multilateral. And certainly China has been a new player or even one of those new leaders in the multilateral system. We see also many Chinese proposals in that regard. So if the two do not see eye to eye on this very fundamental ideological issue, can the two really work together on the trade and economic ties between the two bilaterally? Mr. Paul. Well, there is there's tremendous potential for bilateral uh, trade investment. I, I uh, share the preference of quite a few people that we do these things more multilaterally over time because all of the international trading relationships are so interconnected right. that doing them bilaterally is, a, is, is taking us backwards. Uh, but that's you know, we've had a failure of our policy elite in this country to explain to the American people repetitively and clearly uh, the benefits of doing these multilateral uh, deals, like the NAFTA agreement, for example. And uh, now the po we're harvesting the results of years and years of, of cheap politics where we complain about this or that effect on the economy and don't try to educate our people in the broader impact of these things. The U.S. should be working multilaterally with China on a host of issues that are the post post Cold War uh, topics that will drive our futures and employ our youth mm. uh, for decades to come and that's I wish our, our, our vision would go up a bit and we'd aim at those those targets I see Professor Gleeman do you agree uh, yes, at least in part. I, there are some issues where the U.S. and China could be working better and closer together. I think the Chinese involvement in, in international infrastructure and through uh, increased involvement in the development banks could be a good development in terms of the needs in the world that both China and the U.S. need to address. And I, I also agree that we're missing the multilateral forum. But in part, what, what we're missing about it is one where the is a, a core reason why the U.S. and China are at odds. At the end of the day, the U.S. and China have two different views of how national economies should function and, and their responsibility around issues like subsidies and, and rule of law and, uh, you know, the amount of influence in a government in the economy. Mm. And it's very difficult to see a moment where China changes that behavior, which is the, the, the sort of economic uh, status that most uh, most. Uh, uh, economies in the world have to become a more market-oriented economy because there's not a lot of impetus for them to do so without the sort of uh, uh, pressure and that can come from a multilateral forum. Right. And without something like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, I think it's very difficult to see how the U.S. moves on that needle. And if they can't move that needle, it makes it difficult to get some of these other larger issues uh, resolved, at least for, for U.S. policymakers. I see your perspective. But what about another question, uh, Mr. Yang here in Beijing? You know, this U.S.-China or China-U.S. comprehensive economic dialogue goes in parallel mm -hmm. with the earlier diplomatic and strategic dialogue mm -hmm. between China and the United States, security rather, dialogue yeah. between yeah. China and the United States. <coughs> and it was based on the fact that the two presidents met in Mar-a-Lago, 
Mm -hmm. had great discussion. Uh -huh. They seemed to look at each other's <coughs> eyes and say, well, this is someone that I'm going to work with and I need to work with in the future. Mm -hmm. But that, from President Trump's perspective at least, seemed to suggest it has a lot to do with China's capability to put on pressure on mm -hmm. DPRK yeah. and how much role China will play in that specific issue. But now, it is very clear, China's national interests do not necessarily go 100% hand in hand with every action that the U.S. thinks China should play, take place. Yeah. So here's the thing, without that kind of coordination mm -hmm. to a 100% perfect level as President Trump sees it, will other platforms of China-U.S. relations following Mar-a-Lago be able to achieve their goals? at least with uncertainties in the United States, particularly from the Trump administration. So, Mr. Yang, I want, to, want you to help us to understand this from the Chinese side. Well, for Ch from China's uh, point of view, uh, we should uh, firstly separate the North Korean cooperation from the cooperation and the exchanges on the economic ties, because that is a security issue, although that includes some economic sanction measures relating to the economic part. But President Trump is all about deals. Well, as he said it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a different mindset between America and the Chinese. Let's set, uh, let's set aside <laughs> the differences. <laughs> difference on the mindset, and the differences of assessment about the sanction effects on pulling North Korea uh, uh, okay. back. And the the fact is, the coordination, the cooperation, the differences on North Korea issue should not affect the uh, discussions and cooperation on economic uh, All right. fronts. Mr. Paul, I, do have your, I need to have your words as well. Really, it should, but it will it. It should not have much effect, but will it have much effect? Well, I, thought we, I think we saw in the initial reaction at the time of the, the security dialogue that the administration felt that China had not performed up to its expectations on the question of, of North Korea, and therefore the U.S. Uh, initiated uh, an arms sale to Taiwan of trafficking in persons, refining on Chinese behavior in, in that issue area, and, uh, and a couple of other areas. Um, they're mixing apples and oranges in ways that I think are highly unproductive mm. and will be frustrating to their long-term objectives. Um, this is a kind of action-reaction uh, psychology that seems to be driving the system right now, not a strategic focus on how to achieve a prioritized set of objectives. Uh, and as long as we stay in a reactionary mode, we're going to be disappointed with the results. This year is going to be tough. We see political challenges in Washington, D.C. Uh, of course, in China, we have the upcoming 19th Party Congress in which a lot of decisions will also be made as well. So we'll see how things are evolving from here and how it might have its impact on the U.S.-China economic and trade ties. But for now, gentlemen, thank you so much for your insights and your input. Let's wish the best. Thank Yang Xiyu, Liu Baocheng, Douglas Paul, Steve Gilliman. Thank you so much. You're watching World Insight with Tian Wei coming to you live from Beijing. Still to come on our program. Urbanization and the decline of agriculture-based economy has left some countries dependent on food imports. Today, we speak to a scientist who explains how globalization can help feed our planet with big data. Welcome back. You're still watching World Inside with Tianwei coming to you live Monday to Friday on CGTN. As globalization and urbanization develop rapidly, agricultural trade has become common in our daily life. Some countries are becoming increasingly reliant on foreign sources for food. Food production and consumption have become decoupled, making it more difficult to see cause and effect between our diets and agricultural landscapes that we depend on. With the development of social productivity and the advance of science and technology, our society is transforming from an agriculture-based society to an industry-based society. This process is called urbanization. Urbanization has been the trend of many countries since the Industrial Revolution. Although initially regarded as an advance in the quality of human life, problems quickly emerged. 
One of them is the decrease of agricultural land use. It results in many countries being dependent on other countries for food. This spawns the agricultural globalization, which now shapes land use worldwide and reshapes the food supplies of many nations. An illustration of this food globalization system is shown in this map here, which shows a network depicting the global reach of the United Kingdom's calorie supply from imported food sources. Agricultural trade can also promote the most efficient use of resources for agricultural output and reduce the amount of land, fertilizer, and water required to produce food calories on a global scale. However, as food consumers, we're also increasingly urban. This compounds the challenges of globalization in separating us from food production landscapes. How can globalization serve us and the agricultural trade in the most sustainable way? And to answer that question, I talked to Graham McDonald, who studies land use and food systems. His research provides support for world policymakers on land planning. He also directs his concerns to the current progression of urbanization. Take a look. Graham, it's such a pleasure to have you on CCTV News. Oh, well, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. I had a great opportunity looking at the videos. It is mainly big data illustrating the relations between agriculture and biodiversity. Tell me more about it. Yes, well, so what we're, we're using this time-lapse technology to look at patterns in land use and land cover over time. Uh, how are cities growing? Um, where are cities growing? And then we're also looking at the relationship that that has with agriculture. So um, when cities grow, are they converting agricultural land uh, into other land uses? Are we building, building up those agricultural lands? And, and what does that mean in terms of uh, food production and the mm. environment? What have you found out? We're using these data to tell a story. Um, so there's, Where are the data coming from? These are from satellite images. So it's a collection of thousands and thousands of satellite images that were collected from the early 1980s till about the uh, the early 2010s. From where? Uh, from around the world, collected with satellites. So these satellite sensors can observe um, what land cover patterns look like around the world. A team from Carnegie Mellon University has put them all together in an amazing display where you can look anywhere in the world mm. and, and see a sequence of what the land cover looked like over time. What we see is that in many places you can see the emergence of, of really large urban areas, mega cities. So mm. one example we give is, is the growth of Shanghai. Um, that's just a really great portrayal of massive urban growth. But we can see that in many other places. We also show uh, uh, the sequence of land cover change in Dallas Fort Worth in Texas mm -hmm. and we can just see a large amount of urban sprawl in that area. When a city grows it can expand and, and we can clear the land and, 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 and change the way we're using it. So we might uh, convert a farmer's field into uh, residential development so people can live and that's really important. Um, but we also have to think about you know what that means in terms of loss of fertile agricultural lands. It could also go clear forests and then we have to think about what impacts that could have on ecosystems and the benefits that, that people could derive from those forest ecosystems. Exactly how we are seeing the change, the so-called internationalization of agriculture, how it's been having its impact on us. What we see is that some countries have become very export oriented. So they're using a large amount of the agricultural lands in those, in those countries to produce exports that are consumed abroad. Um, with my research, what I'm doing is looking at all the different trade flows of different food commodities around the world. So many thousands of different trades that are happening. And I'm combining that with data on agriculture from and, and agricultural productivity and using that to estimate how much land was, was required. I calculate that about 20% of the world's croplands are harvested to produce exports that are ultimately consumed in other countries from where they were grown. Yes, indeed. And we are consuming agricultural products that are not necessarily by nature belong to our region. Mm -hmm. And we are cross-season consuming products uh, in agriculture. What would these mean, in, uh, in fact, the two both the land on which they're being grown, the different kind of biotechnologies being used, and also eventually on the quality 
of agricultural products that people are consuming these days. It's so clear uh, that we're there's enormous benefits of international trade in food. Uh, I'm from Canada, so a very uh, northern cold country uh, <laughs> that doesn't produce tropical food commodities. So I'm able to go to my supermarket and enjoy those, those different commodities all year round, as you mentioned. And that's probably a really fundamental way that uh, as food consumers that we're benefiting mm. from trade. We can use our agricultural lands or use our lands for other purposes if one country might specialize in producing certain types of commodities and then import those that no longer produces. But we have uh, increasingly complex supply chains. It can also raise other issues in terms of the environmental impacts of production. Mm. We have to think about food safety. Um, all of those are really important concerns that I think tightly wound up in this question of mm. globalization. Yes, indeed. When it comes to international agricultural trade, you will see one country will become a a huge producer of one kind of agricultural commodities and it's being exported to all over the world. For example, soybean from the United States to China and elsewhere. Or the other way around are different kinds of agricultural products. How that's been changing our landscape? Definitely we see specialization and, and concentration of certain types of commodity crop production in certain countries. So uh, you mentioned soy. Um, just three countries produce and export more than 80% of soy, uh, the United States, Brazil, and Argentina. Uh, for example, in the United States, certain states in the what's often described as the Corn Belt uh, yeah. are very, very specialized in producing corn and soy. So we often see those crops are produced in a rotation. So one crop will be harvested and then another will be planted and then harvested mm -hmm. and, and they'll be switched. So that's a very specialized system. And, and if we go back to that looking out the train window that I mentioned, you know, that's really shaped by the demand for those commodities and farmers' decisions to produce them. Another example would be palm oil. Indonesia and Malaysia are massively dominant in producing palm oil, and much of that is being exported. Particularly in Indonesia has been an important driver of deforestation recently. Asian developing countries need to have a way out in terms of developing their economy. They want to have an advantage point. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, these advantage points in the future could have an impact on their ecosystem. Mm -hmm. But at this development stage, is there a way out? There's a lot of uh, important uh, emerging uh, trends that, are, that we're seeing that, that hold a lot of promise for the future. Uh, one example would be sustainability certification. So a lot of co companies are committing to only sourcing uh, commodities like soy or palm from farms that didn't uh, didn't cause deforestation mm. to produce those commodities. And so that's trends that we can see that are happening and, and in, in certain areas that I, I think hold a lot of promise. And it also allows us as consumers to be more confident mm. about the, the foods that we're, mm. we're consuming. Welcome back. Our last story for today, the Di Tan Temple Fair, one of Beijing's most popular and long-standing festivals, has arrived in Moscow, and it's brought a taste of Chinese art and culture to the Russian capital. The last part of today's program, we take you to Moscow to have a look. Traditional Chinese dance, calligraphy, delicate silk embroidery, and other authentic Chinese handcrafts are at display in Moscow. The four-day-long Ditang Temple Fair is underway in the Russian capital. It brings the spirit and taste of Chinese traditions and culture to Russia. This fair displays some 40 traditional Chinese handcrafts. Many of them can boast centuries-long traditions. So we hope this fair will help promote better understanding between our two nations and help us reach common goals. Woodcovers and potters, doll and fan makers from Hebei province are all happy to show off their skills and share their secrets, how to tie a knot for luck, for example. I study this handcraft as a student and I came here to Moscow to show this traditional Chinese art to the Russian people. Russian visitors seem enchanted by their masterpieces and eager to learn more about Chinese traditions. Chinese knot making is a very interesting part of the culture and identity, so of course it is interesting to see it with your own eyes. It all seems interesting to me. There are fascinating paintings and over there are some interesting handcrafts. Perhaps I'll find some good tea here. 
I want to explore it all. Of course China is interesting. I haven't been to China, but I really want to. It's my big dream to visit China. Besides authentic handcrafts, the fair introduces Russian visitors to traditional Chinese dance, opera and other activities. The organizers of the fair say it is aimed at promoting cultural ties between the two countries that already enjoy close political and economic cooperation. They hope it will help build bridges between the two nations. Daria Bandarchuk, CGTN, Moscow. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us, World Insights CGTN, in your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and see the Weibo. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Insight with Tian Wei team, thanks for watching. And tune in again next time for insights across China and around the world. Good night.